The P-85 Goblin was the only airplane that ever flew, which was designed from scratch to be operated entirely from another airplane. All other Parasite airplane projects use modifications of existing airplane designs to accomplish the task. The development of the B-36 by the Consolidated Volte Aircraft Corporation of Fort Worth, Texas, resulted in a requirement for a means to provide fighter protection for the bomber at any distance from the friendly base that far exceeded the range of currently available escort fighter airplanes. During World War II, American bombers such as the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress, Consolidated B-24 Liberator, and Boeing B-29 Super Fortress were protected by the long-range escort fighters such as the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt and North American P-51 Mustang. On April 11, 1941, the Army Air Corps issued a requirement for a strategic bomber that could carry 10,000 pounds of bombs over a distance of 5,000 miles and still return. The cruise speed of the B-36 was to be approximately 240 to 300 miles per hour. That meant that the bombing missions would take place over 30 hours. There was no fighter that could escort the bomber over that distance. The development cost for longer-ranged flights was high, while aerial refueling was still considered risky and the technology difficult. Pilot fatigue had also been a problem during the long fighter escort missions in Europe and the Pacific, giving further impetus to innovative approaches. Due to the inability of contemporary fighters to escort B-36 bombers all the way to their targets, the Army Air Corps initiated Project MX-472, Unconventional Fighter Design Studies, on December 3, 1942. On January 17, 1943, the Chief of the Air Staff at Army Corps Headquarters requested an examination of the concept of drone crash fighters to protect very heavy bombers on very long-range missions. The crash fighters would be powered with ramjets and operated by radio control. The technology demands of the development of crash fighters were intractable. Such remotely operated drones required some means to transmit enough information from the drone to the remote pilot aboard the bomber for him to successfully engage and shoot down enemy fighter airplanes with human pilots on board. By January 1944, the Air Technical Service Command refined the RFP and, in January 1945, the specifications were further revised for the MX-472 to specify a jet-powered aircraft. In October of 1944, the Army Air Corps expressed interest in the development of a parasite fighter that could be carried by bombers. This fighter would be available before the B-36 entered service, particularly the Boeing B-29 Superfortress. McDonnell created its Model 27 to keep the Army Air Corps specification. The Model 27 was a single-seat, single-engine, jet parasite fighter. The initial concept for the Model 27 was for the fighter to be carried half-exposed under the B-29, B-35, or B-36. The USAAF rejected this proposal, citing increased drag and hence the reduced range for the composite bomber fighter configuration. In November 1944, the Air Corps then asked McDonnell for a design that could be carried completely inside one of the bomber bays of a North Drop B-35 or Consolidated Volt e B-36. In response, McDonnell presented its revised models, 27B, 27C, and 27D. The Boeing B-29 was not large enough to carry the new fighter internally. On January 3, 1945, the War Department authorized the Air Technical Service Command to enter into a contract with McDonnell to develop the Parasite Fighter. The development of the Parasite Fighter was conducted under the auspices of Project MX-667, the company's Model 27 proposal was completely reworked to meet the new specifications. On March 19, 1945, McDonald's design team led by Herman D. Barkery submitted a revised proposal, the extensively redesigned Model 27D. The smaller aircraft had an egg-shaped fuselage, three fork-shaped vertical stabilizers, horizontal stabilizers with a significant dihedral, and 37 degrees swept back folding wings to allow it to fit into the confines of a bomb bay. The aircraft measured 14 feet 10 inches long, the folding wings spanned 21 feet. Only a limited fuel supply of 112 US gallons was deemed necessary for the specified 30-minute combat endurance. The addition of the requirement that the Parasite fighter fit completely inside the bomb bay of a B-36 demanded a complete redesign of the concept. 
McDonald constructed a wooden mock-up of the Model 27E for inspection by representatives of the Air Force and Consolidated Full T. They also built a mock-up of an entire B-36 bomb bay, complete with the Goblin trapeze installation. On the 9th of October 1945, the USAAF signed a letter of intent covering the engineering development of two prototypes, although the contract was not finalized until February of 1947. The definitive parasite fighter contract, calling for the production of two prototype airplanes in a static test article, was approved on February 5, 1947. The McDonald Model 27E was selected to meet the requirement for the high-altitude parasite airplane. The Model 27E was redesignated XP-85, but by June 1948, it was changed to XF-85 and given the name Goblin. McDonald had a tradition of naming its aircraft after mythical creatures of the spirit world. Their first Air Force fighter had been called the Moonbat. Their naval fighters were named Phantom, Banshee, and Demon. There were plans to acquire 30 production P-85s, but the USAAF took cautious approach. If test results from the two prototypes were positive, production orders for more than 100 of the Goblins would be finalized later. During wind tunnel testing at Maffet Field, California, the first prototype XF-85 was accidentally dropped from a crane at the height of 40 feet, causing substantial damage to the forward fuselage, air intake, and lower fuselage. It was later determined that the sky hook latch had been improperly reassembled after the arrival of the Goblin at the wind tunnel facility. XP-85 was disassembled and loaded into a Fairchild C-82 packet to be returned to McDonnell in St. Louis for repairs to its fuselage. The second prototype had to be substituted for the remainder of the wind tunnel tests and the initial flight tests. Following the completion of the wind tunnel tests at Ames, the XF-85 was returned to McDonald in St. Louis in the early spring of 1948. McDonald spent two months preparing the Goblin for its first flight. It was disassembled for shipment to Maroc Air Force Base on May 17, 1948. This base was selected as the location for the flight tests of the XF-85. By 1948, Maroc Air Force Base had become the primary flight test and research base of the Air Force and the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. As a production series B-36 was unavailable, all XF-85 flight tests were carried out using a converted EB-29B Super Fortress mothership. This mothership had a modified cutaway bomb bay complete with a trapeze, front airflow deflector, and an array of camera equipment and instrumentation. The pilot of the XF-85 Goblins on all seven flights was Edwin F. Schock. Schock had graduated from the Virginia Polytechnic Institute in 1941. He was commissioned as an ensign in the U.S. Navy in April 1942. He flew one tour of duty in F-6F Hellcats with VF-19 aboard the USS Lexington. He shot down four Japanese airplanes. His awards included the Navy Cross, Distinguished Flying Cross, and the Air Medal. At the war's end, he was flying Corsairs with a VBF-150 on USS Lake Champlain. Shock took a job with McDonnell as a test pilot. While Monstro was airborne, Ed Schock prepared for the first XF-85 free flight by practicing the approach to Monstro's trapeze in a Lockheed F-80 shooting star. A wire representation of the skyhook was installed on the nose of the shooting star. A pilot in a second F-80 flew chase on Schock's airplane. A second B-29 flew alongside Monstro to film the operation. Although the shooting star and the Goblin had roughly similar performance, the XF-85 would prove to be more challenging to fly. Since the EB-29B, named Monstro, was smaller than the B-36, the XF-85 would be flight-tested half-exposed. To load the XF-85 into the host plane, a special loading pit was dug into the tarmac at South Base, Murdoch Airfield, where all the flight tests had originated. On July 23, 1948, the XF-85 flew the first of five captive flights designed to test whether the EB-29B and its parasite fighter could fly mated. The XF-85 was carried in a stowed position, but was sometimes tethered and extended into the airstream with the engine off, for the pilot to gain some feel for the aircraft in flight. The first free flight of the XF-85 occurred on August 23, 1948. Albert Korschel flew the EB-29B at 200 miles per hour for a few minutes after it had reached the launch altitude of 20,000 feet to cool down its engines. 
Shock started the engine of the XF-85 and ran through the pre-release checklist. While he had established that the systems of the Goblin were functioning properly, he called to Ish to raise the horse collar. Shock toggled the switch to tumble the head of the Goblin Skyhook. The XF-85 rapidly fell away from the trapeze. Shock spent 10 minutes feeling out the controls of the little airplane. He varied its airspeed from 180 to 250 miles per hour. He stabilized the XF-85 in level flight and tested each control in turn. Shock felt that the Goblin's stability and control in roll was excellent. Its stability and control in yaw was not quite as good, but it was still positive. When he attempted a hookup, it became obvious the Goblin was extremely sensitive to the bomber's turbulence, as well as being affected by the air cushion created by the two aircraft operating in close proximity. Constant but gentle adjustments of throttle and trim were necessary to overcome the cushioning effect. After three attempts to hook onto the trapeze, Shock miscalculated his approach and struck the trapeze so violently that the canopy was smashed and ripped free, and his helmet and mask were torn off. He saved the prototype by making a belly landing on the reinforced skid at the dry lake bed at Maroc. After boosting the trim power by 50%, adjusting the aerodynamics and other modifications, The pilot of the B-29 that was flying Chase offered to provide a commentary over the radio on the progress of the Goblin's approach to the trapeze. Shock signaled the trapeze operator to lower the horse collar onto the nose of the XF-85. He shut down the engine and waited a few minutes for it to cool down. Then, he signaled the Ish to retract him into the bomb bay. The successful hook-on increased the optimism of the McDonald team at Murak Air Force Base. The report for the flight test stated, it would appear from this first hook-on that the operation can be performed repeatedly. Shock flew the XF-85 again the following day. His primary objective of the flight was to practice the hook-on procedure. He released the Goblin from the trapeze and maneuvered in the vicinity of the EB-29B for a few minutes. Shock tumbled the head of the Skyhook to release the XF-85 for a second flight and hook-up. Just three minutes later, he engaged the trapeze again. Shock emphasized that the hook-on procedure was not as easy as it had appeared to be after the first hook-on. It required a skilled pilot in favorable conditions to successfully engage the trapeze. During the fifth flight on October 22, 1948, Shock again found it difficult to hook the goblin onto the bomber trapeze. The goblin touched down on the skid at 145 miles per hour, trailing another long plume of dust across Rogers Dry Lake. The turbulent air near the trapeze, in conjunction with the added turbulence from the uncovered skyhook well, made the XF-85 too unstable to hook on to the trapeze. With the first prototype's repair completed, it also joined the flight test program, completing captive flights. While in flight, the Goblin was stable, easy to fly, and recoverable from spins. Although initial estimates of a 648 mile per hour top speed proved to be optimistic, the first test flights revealed that the turbulence during the approach to the B-29 was significant, leading to the addition of upper and lower fins at the extreme rear fuselage, as well as two wingtip fins to compensate for the increased directional instability in docking. All the initial flights had the hook secured in a fixed position, but when the hook was stowed and later raised, the resulting buffeting added to the difficulty in attempting a hookup. To address the problem, small aerodynamic fairings were added to the hook well that reduced the buffeting when the hook was extended and retracted. After repairs to the trapeze, Shock flew the first prototype on the 8th of April 1949, completing a 30-minute free flight test, but after three attempts, abandoned his efforts and resorted to another belly landing at Maroc. The Boeing EB-29B Superfortress had been flown 49 times and accumulated 77 hours and 5 minutes of flight time over the course of the XF-85 flight test program. Monstro carried the first of the XF-85 16 times and launched it another 6 times, it carried the second on one captive flight and launched it just one time. The flying career of the second XF-85 had just consisted of one captive flight and one free flight of 30 minutes duration. No attempt was made to evaluate its speed or altitude capabilities. The highest speed attained by either XF-85 was 362 miles per hour. In spite of the problems encountered with the task of hooking up on the trapeze, Ed Shock was enthusiastic with the flying qualities of the XF-85 in free flight. The pilots flying the Lockheed F-80 chase planes found it difficult to follow the Goblin in a tight turn, but, despite McDonald's proposals for improvements to the design of the Skyhook and Trapeze, the Air Force declined to invest the funds necessary to develop the modified systems. No amount of reworking would be able to provide the Goblin with adequate endurance for its intended mission. 
the limited combat capability provided by the short range of the XF-85 Goblin was not considered sufficient to warrant the cost of its development into an operationally suitable parasite fighter. The Air Force abandoned its attempts to develop a specialized escort fighter that fit entirely within the bomb bay of a B-36. The addition of McDonald's fixed fee brought the total cost of the program to $3,210,000. After the conclusion of the XF-85 Goblin test program, Albert Cordial was hired by Bell Aircraft in New York. Ed Schock was killed in the crash of a McDonnell F-2H-3 Banshee in September 1951. Despite the cancellation of the XF-85, the USAF continued to examine the concept of parasite aircraft as defensive fighters through a series of projects. These included Projects Tiptoe and Projects Fecon and Project TomTom, -Tom, which involved fighter aircraft attached to a bomber aircraft by their wingtips. Project Ficon, codenamed Fighter Conveyor, emerged as an effective Convair GRB-36D and Republic RF-84K Thunderflash combined bomber reconnaissance fighter, although the role was changed to that of strategic reconnaissance. Project FICON drew heavily on data from the abortive XF-85 project and closely followed McDonald's recommendations in designing a more refined trapeze. A total of 10 converted B-36s and 25 reconnaissance fighters saw limited service with Strategic Air Command in 1955 to 1956 before they were supplemented by more effective aircraft and satellite systems. After the program's termination, the two XF-85 prototypes were stored, before being surplused and relegated to museum display in 1950. Following the cancellation of the program, the second of the XF-85s were transferred to the National Museum of the United States Air Force, near Dayton, Ohio on the 23rd of August, 1950, and was one of the first experimental aircraft to be displayed on the new Air Force Museum. For several decades, the aircraft was displayed alongside the museum's Convair B-36. In 2000, the aircraft was moved to the museum's experimental aircraft hangar. Museum staff and visitors objected to this move, believing that the aircraft should be displayed alongside the B-36 to properly represent its original design intentions. XF-85-46-524 was given to the Air Force Exhibit Unit at Norton Air Force Base, California, on December 13, 1950. It was placed on a flatbed truck and served as a mobile display for the Air Force for several years. It was later added to a collection of Air Force airplanes on display at Norton Air Force Base, but the collection was dispersed in the 1960s. The XF-85 that was stationed in Norton Air Force Base was purchased by Talman's Movie Land of the Air Museum and displayed in the Orange County Airport, now John Wayne International, in Santana, California. The museum was owned and operated by Frank Talman and Paul Mance. In May 1968, a large portion of the Movie Land Air Collection was auctioned off. The Air Force then reacquired that XF-85 and put it on display at the Strategic Air Command Museum at Offutt Air Foot Base, Nebraska. The Strategic Air Command Museum has since moved to a new facility between Omaha and Lincoln, Nebraska.